been an exciting day. How many people here were at the keynote? All right, about half. This follows pretty directly from the keynote, and I do encourage people who haven't seen the keynote to go watch it or see if she's put notes to all of the articles uh, she said to read. Um, <laughs> Uh, very good stuff, and uh, it's very related to uh, what I want to talk about, which is how Drupal as a service can save us all. Uh, my name is Ben Nolanson. Um, I am MLNCN on Twitter and almost everywhere online after having a great rationalization of usernames about six years ago. And um, I am in a web development cooperative uh, called GAR. It is um, uh, in Boston and Nicaragua, an international mo uh, corporation of uh, three people. And I have this nice big image because uh, the trip is tax deductible, but spreading knowledge isn't. Um, so here's the advertising. I am thrilled to be in Montreal um, as a worker cooperative. I'm a little bit of a, you know, uh, Agaric's a little bit of a rarity in the US, and it seems much more common here, um, and we're going to be talking about cooperatives, so if you're familiar with any here, that would be great. Um, TNS cooperative is uh, translation and so, uh, so, yeah, transcription, translation, and transcribing, I don't know, uh, but I guess subtitling, um, but I actually use them to uh, transcribe an earlier version of this talk to try to improve it. We'll see if that helps. Um, and uh, and Kumbit, one of the sponsors of this camp, caravan, a uh, digital agency that's worked cooperative, um, Concordia Co-op Bookstore, um, and Tuski, which I have no idea what they do because it was entirely in French, and I don't speak French, but it is a cooperative, and it looks like you can get food there. All right. So um, sort of talking about um, what... You know, following on the keynote, what can we do as technologists, as tech, tech workers um, in uh, working in a software project like Drupal, what can we do to um, change the sort of balance of power in the world, which we'll talk about a bit more later, but to put out some really broad goals for humanity by way of a software project, um, we can communicate widely with one another. It's been a core goal of of Drupal and uh, associated things like WordPress and now Backdrop from the start. Um, stay in control of our communication, check also. Uh, we can earn livings, which gives us a degree of freedom. Um, and, and I'm adding on what I want to push forward with is gaining the most power possible over our own lives and using the experience of um, collective action to uh, establish justice and liberty for us all. So this is where technology is taking us currently. Um, this is a, a not a, not a self-driving car, not supposed to be anyway. Uh, this is a car um, where they hooked up the uh, electronics, you know, just steering and power steering brakes to the general uh, computer system of the car, which includes the media player, which is hooked up to the internet. And it was <laughs> very easily hacked. This is a a journalist driving it and knows someone's going to be hacking it. Um, they had no prior connection to it, um, and they're able to hack it. And uh, this is a Jeep. They had to recall, you know, tens of thousands um, because of this. It's it's you know pretty scary, but it's like okay. I mean, capital. This doesn't benefit capitalism. They'll they'll probably our corporations should be able to figure this out. Um, this is the, the brain virus, uh, copyright 1986. Um, it was uh, first MS-DOS, Microsoft, uh, first computer virus to get out there and hit it big. There's a couple versions of the story. Uh, these brothers in, in Pakistan, who are still at the address that they put right in the virus, um, <laughs> were either trying to, um, you know, sort of flag um, theft of intellectual property, but the version of the story I like much better is that uh, they were used to the Unix world, they saw this Microsoft stuff coming in and like, this is incredibly insecure, how are people using it? And just 
did this virus as a proof of concept, and it infected like most of the computers in the world at that time. And it sort of continued. Um, you know, corporations lose millions. It's very hard to estimate, but they lose millions from viruses. And the WannaCry ransomware attacks were just in the news. This is something that affects, you know, the the power structure and. We as a society and those who have a lot of control over how resources are used haven't managed to fix it. Like they just haven't prioritized uh, tech that we actually control. Um, but even when we do have control, the real question is who controls it. And I apologize for this next slide as, as I've gotten feedback. Like that went dark really quickly. Um, the only time this presentation is really like, um, gone well was and I directly followed uh, someone who talked about IBM's collusion in, in enabling the Holocaust. Um, and then compared to that, I was pretty much entirely, um, you know, happiness and light. Um, <laughs> but that's only, only in that extreme comparison. Um, so uh, this is Corin Gaines. How many people have heard of Corin Gaines? Uh, that's, that's almost a scary part. Um, she's a woman, um, lives in Baltimore, um, had a five-year-old son. She was pretty paranoid about the police killing her for, turns out, fairly rational reasons. And she frequently told her, uh, you know, anyone, but told her son, like, if something happens, pick this up, keep recording. Um, so the police are going to, you know, to go, go to her house um, to pick her up on some very minor thing like you know you know contempt of court for or you know failing to failing to pay fines like totally nothing nothing violent nothing anything um but she says no you're not taking me in you're not you know serving a warrant um you know stay out of here and she had a she's on her front porch with a shotgun and so it's like seven hours into the stand in the standoff um again it's not for anything that there is actually any need for the police to bother with. Um, but uh, the police department in Baltimore asks the county police, um, actually ask Facebook to turn off her account, her live stream, that she's been filming all of this. Um, very soon after that, um, after her Facebook and Instagram accounts are turned off, the officers shot Corin Gaines to death and wounded her five-year-old son. Um, like, this is sort of like that <laughs> moment where it's like, okay, like, police have used their ability to make requests of the corporations that control our communications infrastructure to make the whole um, thing go dark when they want there to only be one side to the story. Um, and, yeah, so it's... Uh, anyhow, so I, I think that we, you know, that's that's the the most recent case for taking very seriously the need to to control our own software. So that's that's you know some of the importance I'm trying to take to this. Um, so um, taking control of our software in our lives um, in a software project, what leads to long-term success? Uh, new contributors with new ideas. People continue to join and pay to use. Like We need a business model, but um, get to that later. Um, so that requires an easy, low-cost cost way for people to get started. Um, means new users also bring their needs and ideas. And people feel they have meaningful control, and people do, in fact, have meaningful control. Um, and you know, back years ago, Drupal did a better job of that. Um, you know, someone wanted a website, you found it, you download it, you got going. That's not the way you do websites really anymore. Um, so I just stole, I gave another version of this talk uh, in, at the Boston meetup and I just stole quotes from two of the attendees from right during that meetup. They had no idea. Um, but quotes on Drupal, it's no longer exciting. Do it in your garage, it's not fun. Um, needs a train, team of trained engineers to support, and we've long, you know, dealt with this learning curve. Um, 
of, of doing it. And so if, if we want to be successful as a software project and, and have the capability of involving a large number of, of people and changing the world, we need to bust down the doors to um, contribution, which Drupal is going in the right direction finally with um, letting people start projects, but that's still like really steep curve. Like, you know, I started doing web development, you say, I make websites, and someone would pay you to do that. And now that's sort of, you know, malpractice to do that. So like if you do a website for someone, you'd probably be putting them on Squarespace or some other platform where we don't, where you don't control it, your client doesn't control it. Um, and so that's where we're getting to software as a service to start to bring the, that, uh, that control. Um, and yeah, um, so open source free software has been um, most successful. The large projects have been built uh, in large part by people employed full time by large corporations that benefited from the security and stability. Um, Drupal is a little bit of an exception, but the importance of um, people paid by large corporations to Drupal's advancement has frequently been overlooked. Um, views, which is very central to how Drupal works with what was the content construction kit is now just fields, um, both of which are in core now. Um, but you know, you, you can't imagine Drupal being the world-class CMS it is without the views system of listing content. It's, it's essential to how we do it. And that was Earl Miles working at Sony at the time. They had enough sites where they could just give him, you know, they were, it made sense for him to have enough time to do it. Um, yeah, you know, CCK was um, was done differently. I mean, it was was done um, largely um, by people who did not have um, large employers at the time. Um, you know, so Drupal has been a nice mix, um, but you know, pretending that we haven't needed um, large financing is is fooling ourselves. And that that argument has largely you know. And it, it, but it, you know, for a long time, people were like, you can't involve uh, money in open source. Um, but um, you know, where most uh, you know, software is going to the cloud, um, but where most of the user experience um, effort is able to be put in is on, in proprietary software. And so all of these, you know, um, every cloud surface and big platform you can think of, so. Facebook, Twitter, Slack, you know, all of these billion dollar companies, or some of them are losing value, but um, that uh, <laughs> they're, they're based almost full stack on free software, like all of the way there, but they're putting in tons of effort on this last little layer they keep proprietary, proprietary, but they're built on a free software operating system, servers, programming languages, the databases, the libraries, all of it, and some of it they're contributing there and, and making it free software, but it's because the developers who work for them um, are at the top of the game and only want to work when they can share some of what they're doing. But the last little step, the user experience, is, um, is proprietary or just not shared at any, at any rate. And that's where um, free software is traditionally Open source free software has traditionally fallen behind. Um, you know, we dominate all those places, but we're still, you know, free software is still not used much on the desktop um, compared to Apple or even Microsoft. Um, and, uh, you know, the phones are getting to be more of the layer that's used as proprietary. Um, and it's largely um, because of the the business model. Um, so um, Drupal's founder, Dries Beitart, has actually written some of the best writing about like the open web and um, and the non-open web, the, the walled gardens that are um, that he writes are winning because they have a superior user experience fueled by data and technical capabilities not easily available to their competitors, including the open web and. That's um, not just, um, it's, it's not just the, I mean, the technical capabilities are there, 
um, in large part because they have the funding. And this is frequently venture capital funded based on the idea that they can um, make lots of money coming back. But there's also lots of um, software that's funded simply by uh, user fees. And that's where you know, free software, like that's the perfect business model for free software. It's like people want to pay for the convenience of having the software hosted somewhere else. Um, but we can actually have a business model where we're directly responsible to the users, to the end users, to the customers, rather than um, their free software has been for a long time. The, the core work has been done um, you know, for, on behalf of corporations or as developers just you know, scratching our own itch, as the saying goes. So um, talked a lot about the you know, sort of the, the moral imperatives, the, the importance for humanity of getting uh, free software to have a larger share of, of uh, the things that affect our lives, especially communication and logistics and infrastructure. Um, but um, the opportunity here is that there's actually a real business model for free software as a service. Um, which we can call open SaaS or Libre SaaS. And that is the scalability. You get started much easier um, rather than, you know, in the Drupal context, hiring someone to develop your website from, from scratch or the 80% Drupal gives you. You can get something that's 97, 98%, or, you know, just used as a turnkey solution or have someone just customize a little bit. You know, if we were actually developing Drupal tailored to a specific purpose, which with this business model would be much easier to do. Um, so the Libre SaaS provider can handle spikes and growth and a switch to provider, and, and, you, and you can switch provider or self-host if your needs demand. Um, costs, again, same thing, low startup costs, and you always have the option of self-hosting. So one of the issues with... Um, you know, I mean, Drupal community is dealing with it right now. A lot of people have moved to Slack, and Slack is, you know, free uh, to start out with. Um, but if you actually want all of its features, it's got a per-user license, which is no way a community like Drupal could ever, ever afford. So the business models of um, software as a service is usually only going to suit corporations, and whereas Libre SaaS can work both, you know, can make money from corporations, which also want the potential of bringing the control back in house, um, and still provide something that can work for, um, uh, you know, grassroots community efforts that may not have the same, be able to handle the same business model that, you know, same uh, pricing structure that a corporation can do to handle enterprise software. Um, and same, same sort of perfect balance for Libre SaaS and control and ownership. The provider can handle backups and security, but you can take the code and the data to a new provider or your, your own host like that. Like that's um, the promise. And again, um, you know, uh, three sort of coined the term open SaaS and I think 2014, um, but you know, Drupal Gardens was one of the big sort of you know open source as a service things in the Drupal world, and that was never core to Acquia's um, business model. So that you know wasn't developed past you know getting it running on Drupal 7 before Drupal 7 was done. Um, so there hasn't been, even though Drupal has been sort of at the center of this, and of course WordPress has had WordPress.com as a, you know, their free software as a service for a long time, but also not focused on specializing it or using it to take it, you know, to the last, to the next, next uh, level um, for specific purposes. Um, but there, there are groups in Drupal doing that. So Roomify is, uh, does booking engines um, with Drupal and, are, you know, it's all free software and, available as a service. And then the biggest one right now, so much so that I'll give their older slide and then older screenshot and then the newer one when I got better at cropping to fit 
projector screens um, is you know replacing intranets with an open source community, and you know they're just started in April um, offering this as a service. Um, they've got a relatively high price point, but for intranets and for sort of large organizations uh, to have groups that work with them each other, it's it's a good value. Um, they really based the concept on work they did for Greenpeace in um, allowing a lot of initiatives and chapters to talk within each other. Are these yeah. actual distributions? Yes, these are distributions. Uh, well, Roomify is not a distribution. It's it's uh, it's modules and stuff all available on on Drupal.org. So uh, Roomify is based largely on the Room module, um, and and they. Uh, so they sort of provide an API, and I think they do some white labeling. But then Open Social is a straight distribution. So you can either download it from Drupal.org or from their GitHub, or you can pay to have them run it, um, which is, you know, again, sort of the best of, potential best of both worlds. Um, still sort of unproven as a business model, um, but uh, most things are. Um, but you know, it's it's much better than distributions on their own. You spend all of this time refining it, um, and then the only way you, as a web development shop, can make money on it is by people who need customizations. It's a complete mismatch. Um, whereas if you're building it for software as a service, the people who can't afford customizations but can't afford the monthly cost um, are actually able to, by there being hundreds or thousands of them, actually able to pay for that continued refinement. So taking up one more um, notch as far as the control that we have over these sort of platforms um, would be to do, um, to, to have the um, software as a service, you know, not just be LibreSAS, be free software, but um, have the the business that's providing the platform itself um, be a be cooperatively owned by the people who depend on it, um, and so it was mentioned in the keynote. Nathan Schneider coined the term "platform cooperative," um, but there had been efforts at sort of um, high-tech solidarity cooperatives or hybrid cooperatives. Here, you might have more than one class of stakeholders, but the um, yeah same idea as any cooperative. It's one person, one vote, rather than um, you know, the shareholders owning the whole thing, one dollar, one vote, and the customers not actually having any say. The idea is that the people most affected, so the members or um, customers, or in some cases workers, um, for example, you know, an Uber style platform cooperative um, could have either the workers, the, the drivers, uh, literally in the driver's seat, owning the platform, or it could have the customers. And they're their projects trying to go both ways with that. Um, so, the Internet of Ownership uh, org, or um, I'll have the link in a minute, um, but IOO.coop, I think, has lists hundreds of such platforms um, in various states of getting off the ground. And most of them have bought on to the idea of also making their software free, um, freely available, so that, um, you know, it's giving people who use it, that extra level of control that they can leave off. But they also have a dem direct democratic control over the platform itself. Um, so the idea is Drupal, cooperatives, uh, two trees is the symbol for cooperatives, and getting the software into the cloud. Um, pieces we're missing uh, are still, like, it's a bit better to go for, uh, uh, like, freedom at the protocol level, not just the software level, so that you're not just locked into, you know, even if it's free software, you're sort of locked into one particular uh, stack. Um, so there's lots of efforts to do federation where you, you know, where you're dealing with protocols. IndieWebCamp or IndieWeb.org is a movement to do very, very basic protocols to, to make the open web have some of the experiences we get from the walled garden, the ability to follow people, um, the ability to, um, you know, 
comment on each other's sites, but have it all in distributed ownership. So I think that's a, a symbiotic um, effort and that if we're serious about having control, we have to be looking at protocols and federation also. So drawing on the cooperative um, movement and its principles of um, solidarity, um, you know, one of the principles is to, is to help build up this, this alternative economy where people have more control and again, um, you know, Montreal and this region is a bit ahead of the US where I'm from on this level, um, but we all have a ways to go. Um, so how did this, can this movement um, make sure it compounds and builds on itself, ensure every success helps others level up, and build in ways such that when one group gains more power with the solidarity of others, that group uses its power to support others. Um, in the cooperative movement, it's essentially making sure that a cooperative stays a cooperative, that you can't demutualize, say like, well, we are the current owners now and we're just gonna sell out um, to another thing. So I, I guess in the news right now, um, so Whole Foods managed to um, buy out or replace a whole bunch of uh, uh, food co-ops and natural food markets and whole, um, you know, actual whole food markets in the in the United States. And now they're being bought by Amazon. <laughs> so it's just like people have totally lost control of their local neighborhood grocery. Um, it's it's pretty insane. And so the idea is that if we had built up food co-ops. Um, the right way, we would have, you know, first of all, we'd have a larger network to be able to, you know, not lose this battle against Walmart and, um, and, uh, and Whole Foods and everything. And there, there is, there's a large worker-owned cooperative that is a bit more socially responsible called Winco, which is successfully competing against Walmart and Whole Foods. It's, you know, it's completely possible. Um, but uh, anyhow, that, that you know, we, we that these we build institutions that can't sell out, that actually stay belonging to the people, um, and that's something that the cooperative movement has been learning because they've seen credit unions demutualize, um, and you know, one group of people make a lot more money, um, but then you know, this this cooperative, this community resource is gone. Um, Gonna go a little more radical in the strategy here. Um, it's essentially to um, just seek out and socialize rents. So these are just I'm gonna give other examples, but the real one is is the network effects of platforms. But um, the idea is that we are having you know value extracted from us, um, and you know we have an economic system that sort of hides the exploitation with the actual creative work and we have to you know break that down so land is sort of the most obvious one like people are collecting rent they're not doing anything like they're just collecting rent because they happen to own the land they didn't do anything to put the value on that land um, they're just doing it so um, uh, you know this is idea going back over a hundred years um, and the Henry George from a hundred years ago but the Henry George School of Social Science is still work you know is, is still updating this theory and is essentially to see, you know, is to separate the value of improvements on the land from the land itself and tax away the, the rent seeking behavior. And, and that can be applied to anything where uh, people are extracting a lot of value not based on um, any input they've put in but because of a, a monopoly control on something. And some monopolies on so-called intellectual property are the same thing, and there's ways to attack that. And then the one most relevant for um, this idea of free software as a service and platform cooperatives is, the, is that network effects are a huge source of value. Um, that the, you know, you know, class example of network effects is the telephone, you know, having one phone uh, is no value having two, or you can talk to somebody, you can add more people. And so all of these network businesses, Facebook, Uber, um, anything you can think of that's, you know, 
that's, uh, you know, has a high market cap, has billions of dollars invested in it, it's based on having a monopoly control over the connections in the network. And, and that's where, like, Though that value, the value of the connections belongs to the people in the network. It doesn't belong to whoever managed to get control of the network. And that's sort of the key thing to target with the platform cooperative and say that we should be in control of that. Um, and, but because there is a lot of value there um, and these you know, corporate attempts at extracting value are not actually that successful. Um, you know, Facebook is connecting billions of people and they're you know able to extract like ten dollars a year from people um, you know less than that um, and so you know in, in when you look at it in those terms it it makes it really you know really open to say well we can either try to take back that infrastructure or build our own and that's sort of the exciting thing about continuing to build up our um, our own web development world and do more uh, platforms, SaaS software as a service, is that that puts us in a stronger position to um, build the networks, capture these network effects. Because it's a lot easier to uh, reclaim uh, you know, our spaces online than it is to, say, reclaim like the global oil supply chain. You know, that's you know, really hard to liberate that from who controls it. But that's, I guess, the classic example of, of, of extracting value that someone's not earning is that because someone has control over a piece of ground, they're pulling out oil or gold or something that they didn't make but are taking the vast majority of the profits and it's really a, a something that belongs to humanity. Um, and the same is true of things built at the very top of the technology stack. That's something that's built on uh, humanity's efforts over the past thousand years and um, and it's being monopolized, and we can try to take it back. Uh, so controlling our infrastructure, communications, material basis for survival, supply chains, um, all of which are really dependent on uh, communications technology. So we're in a, in a good place to do that. We just have to um, you know, get started with the communication side of it. Um, so on how to go about this um, at... Uh, Workers Co-op um, uh, conference a couple years ago, Ed Whitfield of um, F4DC.org, it's worth checking that out. Um, but he was listening to a bunch of web developers talk about building technology platforms like for journalists and readers and about how we were going to do this and you know it will be a democratic platform and here's what should be done. And he said, this sounds like a discussion about building a marketplace organized by the people who make the tables. <laughs> and the, the lesson is that we need to, you know, if we're going to build these um, businesses as democratic organizations, we need to practice a democracy which puts those who are most affected first. And we want to build institutions at world-changing scale. So we want to get out of the smaller cooperatives and build platform cooperatives. Um, and so coming from someone else in the, in the worker cooperative movement who's coming out of the labor movement where he knows that the only way that middle class gets built and such like that is by mass organizations of workers is that we need mass organizations of people to change society. Um, so if we're not focused on things that build scale, we're not building institutions that change society, and if we're not building institutions that change society, we're not doing what we need to do. And so that brings me to the Drutopia project, where I'm trying to funnel all of this into it, um, and very much on the uh, building um, with people who are most affected um, in mind first, um, people who are working in um, for justice in their communities, um, and bring Drupal back to its roots so much, and somewhat and build a, a movement for the grassroots. But the focus much less on the technology than how we go about it, how we, how we co-design this. So drutopia.org, um, please do sign up um, you know, as plans get fleshed out, as a more coherent um, versions of this talk get turned into um, articles. Um, it'll go out there. 
Um, but you know, right now, extremely low volume. We only say when there's actually something um, you know, significant. Um, so, jutopia.org. Um, but the plan to bring all this together in uh, this Jutopia project and I you know, would love to see it in, uh, in related technologies and to really focus on the, the open APIs, the things that make this more than um, one tech. So um, Jutopia has been keeping um, dialogue open with Backdrop. Um, we are trying to um, open dialogue with um, global.coop, which is doing a very similar model in WordPress. Um, and then there's actionnetwork.org, which don't think they're open source yet, but we can work on them. Um, so the plan, build a website as a service platform providing sites for grassroots groups and nonprofits. And again, like you can do in a version of this plan that targets people with more money, that can be a lot more successful, but this is where we're doing it. So all the stuff about software as a service um, really does apply, I think, even better to um, like larger businesses. Like They're the ones that are going to be most worried about uh, software as a service shutting down of having the control um, and that can make um, open source software as a service more attractive to uh, a lot of businesses than proprietary software as a service. But build a platform, um, use the revenue um, from the initial versions to build the best platform grassroots groups, activists, organizers, and movements, including communication that includes communication and relationship management tools. Um, which is where the cool innovation will be, and use that revenue and membership to build the most powerful communication network in the world under democratic control. And that's where we actually start to get some of the control that um, we need to um, not be at the mercy of market and state and other forces that are not always either run with our best interests or mind or just not run that well at all. So, um, take this four ounce rabbit for inspiration. Uh, chewing on one strand of grass in a very, very large area, um, just biting off a little bit that we can chew, and we are we're taking it and going from there. So, um, these are um, just the the key domains that I mentioned io.coop for Internet of Ownership, indieweb.org. Um, again, they, I think I need to find a better uh, example of how to do federation stuff, but um, you know, their commitment to doing protocol first and, and using that to create a completely technology agnostic open web is really exciting. Um, Jutopia.org, of course, and then roomify.us, getopensocial.com, and uh, my own cooperative agaric.coop, which is in some ways the antithesis of all that, and that's a tiny work co-op, but you know, our blog will include more news about stuff like this. Um, any questions? Maybe if you could put that last slide on again, where you yeah. just did it, and talk a bit about them, because I'm trying to figure out exactly what you mean, because it's, um, I mean, I'm with a, a, a co-op, mm -hmm. we have our site done by, in Drupal, by a co-op. Yep. I don't know where on the cloud it is, if, what they're about, yeah. but I'm, like, what more would I, would I do? I understand, like, the difference between Word.com and Word, uh, WordPress, <laughs> yeah. and Org, where you can go to Word.com as a service. Mm -hmm. Where you can take the code and, and then you have to pay for running it and everything like that. Um, are you saying work with companies that are co ops that are creating software that can be run as a, as a service? Yeah. And maybe get open social is like, uh, uh, couldn't be turned off like this poor woman who was, was killed by yeah. uh, these corporate. If, especially if it's so, done as a platform cooperative, which, which oh, get open social is not, but if it were under democratic control of the people in it, much less likely that they'd make policy decisions that would give so much control to outsiders. <laughs> like sort of the issue with a lot of the, you know, Facebook as a software as a service, that a lot of the, the networks that we use is that 
you know, we aren't even customers, but even if we were, we wouldn't have the same power that like the state and investors have. So it's very much um, for building up our own things. But so the idea of what what we need to do is, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, we're also a worker-owned cooperative, and we put our software on um, mayfirst.org, which is totally cooperative, but they see themselves as a membership organization for, you know, the internet as a, as a social movement. So they don't quite identify as a cooperative, but they pretty much structurally are. Um, but what that misses is, is scale. And what the scale for the platform is, is that um, that the um, yeah, I mean, it's two things. First of all, you want um, you know many many more um, customers. You want like WordPress.com level of customers, but with a little bit more focus. Like WordPress, it, it's uh, you know it, it it doesn't have a lot of direction anymore, and WordPress.com doesn't give any. So like if you had um, you know, WordPress.com, even for small businesses, like they were going to make, like, we're going to really focus on one network or for restaurants. And there is an open restaurant um, distribution ready to be turned into, uh, into software as a service and possibly a platform cooperative. Um, anyhow, but the idea is that um, to get lots of customers um, to innovate based on their needs, to actually you know, have the resources coming from people paying for software as a service to now be putting a lot of innovation into the the platform, which we as a, a worker on cooperative, like, yeah, we try to give back, but we're building a site for one person at a time. We're not saying we're going to take this whole sector and build the best site possible. So right now, if you want to do something really cool in Drupal, you need to either find a, a giant, you know, organization that needs stuff, um, or this is the other approach is to find, you know, hundreds or thousands of smaller organizations or individuals that need the same thing. And, you know, you can't aggregate people's needs by, you know, treating them like a client going to each one individually. But if you're offering a software as a service saying, this is what we're going to do. These are our plans, get it out there, market it, you know, iterate on that, see what people really need. Um, but we know we can build the software. Like, we know we can. It's a matter of, of connecting to that market. And so the next step is to um, not just sort of co-design and build something with a particular group, a particular sector, a particular market in mind. It's to give that group formal democratic control. Um, so, I mean, I, I've got a whole bunch of analogies that I used at the the worker conference, so I guess I'll, I'll go for that. Um, but the idea is that um, you know, workplace democracy is only like one component of economic democracy. So if, if you know, workers at a gold mine secured ownership of it and operated solely for their own benefit instead of the benefit of a king or a capitalist or something like that, like, and you know, so the workers of the mine control all of the economic output of the mine. That's not economic democracy in a full sense. You know, here, sort of the reason is pretty easy. The idea that natural resources should belong to all of humanity, um, or at the very least, you know, the people in the region where the natural resources are being extracted from. Um, and, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's several more examples like that. But the idea is that, um, you know, Facebook as a worker cooperative wouldn't be economic democracy. Facebook as a member-owned cooperative where all of the people who are on Facebook have um, a vote and a level of control, that would be empowering. That would be the, the power that society needs. And so it's to build platforms where the members, the people who are most affected, are in control. So, uh, you, know, uh, you know, as a worker cooperative, we build a site for someone. They can go to hundreds of other shops. So, like, our decisions affect primarily us, because the market has other options. But if we're talking about a platform that is going to have that level of monopoly power, that is going to um, you know, be a natural monopoly because of network effects, like, uh, like Facebook is, like Uber wants to be, um, like Airbnb is, 
um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a level of natural monopoly because like once you're in this network and once you're developing your rating and your relationships and, um, and you know, yeah, once you're, you know, once, once you're in the place where everybody else is, that's where the value is. Um, and so they're capturing that value over and above the level of engineering and um, and uh, yeah, engineering and building of the user experience and other levels of innovation that's happening. And so, um, yeah, and be also because many of these are getting much closer to providing essential services. It's you know these are important things to democratize. Um, so both for the capturing of the rents from network effects, the income flows from network effects, or the just the power flows from network effects, because whether they actually, or the value from network effects, because whether they actually get translated into dollars or not is dependent on a lot of things. Like even the capitalist firms can't um, you know, translate all of it, but there's still, it's a lot of power in the network, and that's what should be owned by the people who are members of that network. Yeah? I want to understand, I understand. <laughs> Let's say we make a, a, a restaurant, uh, you know, like a restaurant specialty. We get all, you know, like we get ninety percent mm -hmm. of the small restaurants in the world okay, on our platform. In in the thing that you say, for a restaurant, the restaurant is able to to go somewhere else. It's possible. Well, they could. They could. So yeah, the idea is that if you're on a, a free software as a service thing, like you just you know press a button. And you can self-host. Like it should be that easy. Like because we want to take away the, like you know, some level of that that monopoly power, even in a democratically controlled network for because individual freedom. On, on Facebook, one of the things that we can do because mm -hmm. that would be fun that there could be alternative Facebooks, mm -hmm. and uh, that you can take everything you did, every piece of content, your network, everything could take it and go to alternate network and still mm -hmm. be inside them the same. So yeah. you. Still be in contact with your old Facebook buddies, you know. But everything you take, you can take it and take it away. And right now, it's absolutely impossible yep. to do that. But in in your uh, scheme that you put, okay, um, it would be people keep because you see the network effects is what's making uh, the fact that I'm one, one that I'm part of. Uh, you know, 200, uh, 200 million other restaurants is, is, is where some value is. is it? Mm -hmm. The well, fact that I'm part of a big thing. Yeah, so in, in terms of serving a small business like a restaurant, so I mean, first of all, they're just the economies of scale. Like, it's just, like, we as individual web developers are going to, you know, if Squarespace decides to target small restaurants, you know, if we're trying to build one site at a time, like even building an open source software, we're going to lose. So the, the real you know, dream for me is that we make it both easier for um, you know, regular people, individuals, small businesses, small organizations, to use software like Drupal and that power and freedom that Drupal provides, and make it easier for people who are getting started in web development who may not want to, um, you know, be like, you know, move up the stack um, to enterprise consulting or, you know, offering everything to just be like, yeah, I make a website and like can affordably, you know, take, you know, 500 or $1,000 from somebody um, and just customize um, an existing, um, like existing product, basically. So, I mean, that's what we're doing with Drupal already, but we have to do more than just that last little bit of design and, and other tweaking. Like, we need to take it further, and we need to figure out how to maintain it going ahead, um, which is one of the things that makes it really hard to say, oh, I'm going to make a living building lots of different sites. So if we can say, I build this site and put it on a platform, um, there can be lots more people actually employed in, the, in sort of this free software space and possibly in the web development space period um, than there is now. Um, and those same people, if they're like, well, I... I've like I've outgrown this platform, and I want to take some clients with me to either a new platform, or I just want to focus on just like five like really high need restaurants, or focus on you know restaurants that have relationships with um, like community supported agriculture. 
and you know specialize, you know, do more work for a smaller number. Like all of that's possible. But right now, like, it, you know, it's so hard to get started at the at the at the low level. Um, like you sort of have to be working at a larger company that's doing a website, um, or you go skin Squarespace or something like that. And so the idea is to give people a foothold in something that actually gives more power. Um, but the idea that, you know, so that's, you know, you know, that's just from the sort of the business angle and us contributing to it, but from sort of the level of control that the, um, the, the restaurants could have, for example, would be um, that, you, that, you know, they decide that, okay, let's build in a group ordering system so that they can compete with McDonald's on scale or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's where the real power starts to come in. Mm -hmm. um, and because we're really interested in balancing power, we're gonna start with, you know, say the people, the workers in the restaurant, the people trying to organize, you know, undocumented workers in the restaurant. Because um, we wanna start the power at the bottom and then just help everyone level up. Um, but, but exactly the same idea is, to, is people having democratic control over their software um, in a collective large group um, can can make amazing choices, can take it in amazing directions. Um, yeah. Sorry. Uh, well, there was someone? Uh, yeah, but you're, you're, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you mentioned WordPress.com, and um, a few years ago, uh, Comde.org here in Montreal started working on uh, Eager. Yes. Uh, for making Drupal farms. And when I started, I was dreaming like some kind of CPAP where you would press a button and uh, install me this distribution, that distribution, uh, export the whole thing. Um, and it's kind of lagging now. I'm, uh, are you aware of this project? Yes. Where it's going? Yes. Very aware of Eager, and it's definitely one of the things we're looking at for actually figuring out like, you know, how to technically do this. Um, we're still. Uh, you know, officially agnostic on on that layer of technology, except that we also want it to be, um, you know, part of the free and open stack, like full stack free software. And so, Acre is the player in that game. So, uh, is it uh, so I mean, my my angle is that we've got to first um, uh, put. Um, like do the marketing side first. So lean startup style. Like we know we can do this in Drupal. We know we can adopt Agar to this if if you know that's what we do. So like to get a lot of customers first. I haven't convinced anyone else in Drutopia about this plan, but I, you know, I failed in a startup I was involved in to convince people like no, we we can't just build it first and then hope people need it. We need to be in contact with um, the potential customers uh, first. So. We're, we're doing a decent job on that, but figuring out how to sort of um, scale potential customers is, is part of the goal. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, I do definitely see this sort of the same vision is that like, you know, one platform host, you should be able to choose between a few distributions. And so it's gonna be sort of a, a software co-op that is, is guiding the direction of the, the software, but if you know, someone wants to do a, a hosting installation of it that says, well, we're going to add a few more extras. Like, that's totally there and it totally makes sense. And ideally that, you know, someone is going to do restaurants. Someone is going to do, um, you know, um, you know, intranets, like which open social is, but, you know, can probably take a different angle to that. Um, and that we can start sharing that infrastructure. So open social has not put a lot of their effort into that infrastructure yet. Like and and that's sort of my my idea also is that like, well, that's a scaling problem. Like, you know, we can start out with just, you know, uh, a whole bunch of sites managed by Ansible or something, and that when um, we hit critical mass and we have that opportunity to get the real efficiencies of scale, then we figure it out. Um, and I'm sorry I've lost internet. But I did want to say that, like, um, so Diaspora was the attempt to make the federated Facebook, or Diaspora. Um, it took a bit more of a monolithic, um, like, software approach. Um, but they're still at it. But they definitely, like, un had some unfortunate, um, you know, tech directions and stuff like that. Um, 
and it's not as far along as it should have been given where it started. Um, but um, um, Matterhorn uh, is is like the Twitter replacement that's being quite successful right now, um, and it's based on the GNU Social sort of API, um, and so that is. Uh, yeah, so that's sort of where to look for exactly um, what you're talking about as far as like, oh, like this instance of Twitter is, is you know, is not quite meeting my needs. I'm going to take this here, but I'll still be able to interact with the wider community. So that's, you know, the, again, the GNU social and various things that have built on that API have been around for years. Um, reasonably successful. They've had different waves of like Twitter exiles. And they've managed, like, the first wave was sort of like, you know, the idealist, more like, you know, like, let's, you know, have something that's independent, that's free software. Then there was another wave of sort of the horrible right-wing trolls getting thrown off Twitter. But, like, that was the strength of this federated model, is that th this didn't destroy anything, because they ended up in their own instances. Um, and now there's another wave of, of people... You know, some of who are coming out of there's a there's a buy Twitter campaign, which was the idea of like, look, Twitter is looking for a you know, looking to sell itself. Like its market cap is getting pretty low. Like we the users should just buy it <laughs> and turn it into a platform cooperative. Like just make an end run around this. Um, they got like four percent of the vote at the shareholders meeting, and given the fact that like, you know, most of the shares are controlled by. Um, you know, the insiders of the company that didn't want this, that's reasonably impressive, and so they actually can bring this up to a vote next year. And I'm, you know, mostly not a fan of shareholder activism because we're like, okay, like, the problem is some people have way too much money. They're the ones who control most of the shares of organizations. You know, we're not actually going to, you know, liberate ourselves um, that way. But the um, fact is that shareholder activism does work. Like, ExxonMobil, like, there was a vote for a, uh, environmental transparency report, which the insiders did not want. Like, I mean, that's amazing. So there is potential, and as there, you know, if this sort of platform cooperativism movement can get better known with campaigns like by Twitter, um, it's it's totally possible. Um, yeah. Thank you. Oh yeah, sorry. Okay, so I'm, I'm wondering if the, this this idea of let's say you had a crowdfunding thing to try and get a niche a group of people who would want a particular service, software service or something like that, mm -hmm. and then it, so that they could fund that research and they would have also some yeah. control and buy-in to the cooperative that's developing. Would that be a kind of, of way? Bingo. Yeah. So the, I mean, the thing is, people fund amazing things as as on Kickstarter and stuff like that, right. and they're doing it just because they like the idea. If you are also buying a cooperative membership in a cooperative venture, so that you would be part of the decision making when it inevitably has to pivot from the original idea, um, like I think that's a really strong case. I'm not good at making any kind of cases. I like talk about the stuff I'm most passionate about, and it's just like so so. My friend talks about new tires on his Jeep, and it's the best thing in the world. Um, so I know I'm not the best spokesperson, but that's exactly the, the like the the pitch. It's like, you know, do, do you want to see this in the world? A lot of people are going to say yes. Like, and then it's not just like donating or you know throwing money because people. I mean, again, like people put money into for-profit businesses on Kickstarter just because they want to see that thing in the world, and if. You know, you add the idea that you're going to have that, um, you know, that ownership, that level of control, that it will be accountable to you. I think it's much more, um, much more of an argument. And so, the, yeah, the, the cooperative front, approach, the platform is really exciting. Up. Yep, exactly. This is the model. Yep, you are going to be a member you owner. Get the service you want. Yep. You also have the control. The, the same. Yep, and so that's the, the, to, to mitigate the risk of because you know we need to we need like again. Free software has a vastly superior development model, but we don't have a better funding model. And platform cooperatives and, and software as a service right, gives that potential for a better funding model and actually getting the money in advance because of the control. Yeah. Because the companies use open software, 
and then they then they they use it in that way. Yep, they just right? close off. It just the at the very edge. edge. Yep. It's all based on this, but now well we own it and we're yep. so that that's where we get the we control that we're doing. Yeah. Twitter's uh, Ruby on Rails yep. and, and there's all the stuff yep. is written on open and, and, Yeah. And so without any um, any any real business model at all, there are free software alternatives to Slack. That's pretty good. There's this free software alternative to Twitter. So I'm just, you know, if we can add in a business model with Libre SaaS, with software, free software as a service, right. and then ideally also merit with um, cooperative ownership, like I think we we really do have that potential to to take on the, the proprietary platforms that control so much and then really build on that success. So thank you.